Book One, Chapter Two, Part One of Two of The Beautiful and Damned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book One, Chapter Two, Portrait of a Siren, Part One of Two. Crispness folded down upon New York a month later bringing November and the three big football games, and a great fluttering of furs along Fifth Avenue. It brought, also, a sense of tension to the city and suppressed excitement. Every morning now there were invitations in Anthony's mail. Three dozen virtuous females of the first layer were proclaiming their fitness, if not their specific willingness, to bear children unto three dozen millionaires. Five dozen virtuous females of the second layer were proclaiming not only this fitness, but, in addition, a tremendous undaunted ambition toward the first three dozen young men, who were, of course, invited to each of the ninety-six parties, as were the young ladies' group of family friends, acquaintances, college boys, and eager young outsiders. To continue, there was a third layer from the skirts of the city, from Newark and the Jersey suburbs up to bitter Connecticut, and the ineligible sections of Long Island, and doubtless contiguous layers down to the city's shoes. Jewesses were coming out into a society of Jewish men and women, from Riverside to the Bronx, and looking forward to a rising young broker or jeweler and a kosher wedding. Irish girls were casting their eyes, with license at last to do so, upon a society of young Tammany politicians, pious undertakers, and grown-up choir boys. And naturally the city caught the contagious air of entree. The working girls, poor ugly souls, wrapping soap in the factories and showing finery in the big stores, dreamed that, perhaps in the spectacular excitement of this winter, they might obtain for themselves the coveted mail, as in a muddled carnival crowd an inefficient pickpocket may consider his chances increased. And the chimneys commenced to smoke, and the subway's foulness was freshened, and the actresses came out in new plays, and the publishers came out with new books, and the castles came out with new dances and the railroads came out with new schedules containing new mistakes instead of the old ones that the commuters had grown used to. The city was coming out. Anthony, walking along 42nd Street one afternoon under a steel-gray sky, ran unexpectedly into Richard Caramel emerging from the Manhattan Hotel barber shop. It was a cold day, the first definitely cold day, and Caramel had on one of those knee-length, sheep-lined coats long worn by the working men of the Middle West, that were just coming into fashionable approval. His soft hat was of a discreet dark brown, and from under it his clear eye flamed like a topaz. He stopped Anthony enthusiastically, slapping him on the arms more from a desire to keep himself warm than from playfulness, and after his inevitable handshake exploded into sound. Cold as the devil! Good Lord, I've been working like the deuce all day till my room got so cold I thought I'd get pneumonia. Darn landlady economizing on coal came up when I yelled over the stairs for her for half an hour. Began explaining why and all. God. First she drove me crazy. Then I began to think she was sort of a character and took notes while she talked. So she couldn't see me, you know, just as though I were writing casually. He had seized Anthony's arm and was walking him briskly up Madison Avenue. Where to? Nowhere in particular. Well, then, what's the use? demanded Anthony. They stopped and stared at each other, and Anthony wondered if the cold made his own face as repellent as Dick Caramel's, whose nose was crimson, whose bulging brow was blue, whose yellow unmatched eyes were red and watery at the rims. After a moment, they began walking again. Done some good work on my novel. Dick was looking and talking emphatically at the sidewalk. But I have to get out once in a while. He glanced at Anthony apologetically, as though craving encouragement. I have to talk. I guess very few people ever really think. I mean, sit down and ponder and have ideas in a sequence. I do my thinking in writing or conversation. You've got to have a start, sort of, something to defend or contradict, don't you think? Anthony grunted and withdrew his arm gently. I don't mind carrying you, Dick, but with that coat. I mean, continued Richard Caramel gravely, that on paper, your first paragraph contains the idea you're going to damp or enlarge on. In conversation, you've got your vis-a-vis -vis last statement. But when you simply ponder, why, your ideas just succeed each other like magic lantern pictures, and each one forces out the last. 
They passed Forty Fifty Street and slowed down slightly. Both of them lit cigarettes and blew tremendous clouds of smoke and frosted breath into the air. "'Let's walk up to the plaza and have an eggnog,' suggested Anthony. "'Do you good. Air will get the rotten nicotine out of your lungs. Come on, I'll let you talk about your book all the way.' "'I don't want to if it bores you. I mean, you needn't do it as a favor.' The words tumbled out in haste, and though he tried to keep his face casual, it screwed up uncertainly. Anthony was compelled to protest. "'Bore me? I should say not.' "'Got a cousin,' began Dick, but Anthony interrupted by stretching out his arms and breathing forth a low cry of exultation. "'Good weather!' he exclaimed. "'Isn't it? Makes me feel about ten. I mean, it makes me feel as I should have felt when I was ten. Murderous! Oh, God! One minute it's my world, and the next I'm the world's fool. Today it's my world, and everything's easy, easy. Even nothing is easy. Got a cousin up at the plaza. Famous girl. We can go up and meet her. She lives there the winter, has lately anyway, with her mother and father. Didn't know you had cousins in New York. Her name's Gloria. She's from home, Kansas City. Her mother's a practicing billfist, and her father's quite dull, but a perfect gentleman. What are they? Literary material? They try to be. All the old man does is tell me he just met the most wonderful character for a novel. Then he tells me about some idiotic friend of his, and then he says, There's a character for you. Why don't you write him up? Everybody'd be interested in him. Or else he tells me about Japan or Paris or some other very obvious place and says, Why don't you write a story about that place? That'd be a wonderful setting for a story. How about the girl? inquired Anthony, casually. Gloria. Gloria what? Gilbert. Oh, you've heard of her. Gloria Gilbert. Goes to dances at colleges. All that sort of thing. I've heard her name. Good looking. In fact, damned attractive. They reached 50th Street and turned over toward the avenue. I don't care for young girls as a rule, said Anthony, frowning. This was not strictly true. While it seemed to him that the average debutante spent every hour of her day thinking and talking about what the great world had mapped out for her to do during the next hour, any girl who made a living directly on her prettiness interested him enormously. Gloria is darn nice, not a brain in her head. Anthony laughed in a one-syllabled snort. By that you mean she hasn't a line of literary patter. No, I don't. Dick, you know what passes as brains in a girl for you? Earnest young women who sit with you in a corner and talk earnestly about life. The kind who, when they were sixteen, argued with grave faces as to whether kissing was right or wrong, and whether it was immoral for freshmen to drink beer. Richard Caramel was offended. His scowl crinkled like crushed paper. No, he began, but Anthony interrupted ruthlessly. Oh, yes, kind who just at present sit in corners and confer on the latest Scandinavian Dante available in English translation. Dick turned to him, a curious falling in his whole countenance. His question was almost an appeal. What's the matter with you and Maury? You talk sometimes as though I were a sort of inferior. Anthony was confused, but he was also cold and a little uncomfortable, so he took refuge in attack. I don't think your brains matter, Dick. Of course they matter, exclaimed Dick angrily. What do you mean? Why don't they matter? You might know too much for your pen. I couldn't possibly. I can imagine, insisted Anthony, a man knowing too much for his talent to express, like me. Suppose, for instance, I have more wisdom than you, and less talent. It would tend to make me inarticulate. You, on the contrary, have enough water to fill the pail and a big enough pail to hold all the water. I don't follow you at all, complained Dick, at a crestfallen tone. Infinitely dismayed, he seemed to bulge and protest. He was staring intently at Anthony and caroming off a succession of passers-by who reproached him with fierce, resentful glances. I simply mean that a talent like Wells's could carry the intelligence of a Spencer, but an inferior talent can only be graceful when it's carrying inferior ideas, and the more narrowly you can look at a thing, the more entertaining you can be about it. Dick considered, unable to decide the exact degree of criticism intended by Anthony's remarks. But Anthony, with that facility which seemed so frequently to flow from him, continued, his dark eyes gleaming in his thin face, his chin raised, his voice raised, his whole physical being raised. Say I am proud and sane and wise, an Athenian among Greeks. Well, I might fail where a lesser man would succeed. He could imitate, he could adorn, he could be enthusiastic. 
he could be, hopefully, constructive. But this hypothetical me would be too proud to imitate, too sane to be enthusiastic, too sophisticated to be utopian, too Grecian to adorn. Then you don't think the artist works from his intelligence? No. He goes on improving, if he can, what he imitates in the way of style, and choosing from his own interpretation of the things around him what constitutes material. But after all, every writer writes because it's his mode of living. Don't tell me you like this divine function of the artist business. I'm not accustomed even to refer to myself as an artist. Dick, said Anthony, I want to beg your pardon. Why? For that outburst. I'm honestly sorry. I was talking for effect. Somewhat mollified, Dick rejoined. I've often said you were a Philistine at heart. It was a crackling dusk when they turned in under the white façade of the plaza and tasted slowly the foam and yellow thickness of an eggnog. Anthony looked at his companion. Richard Caramel's nose and brow were slowly approaching a like pigmentation. The red was leaving the one, the blue deserting the other. Glancing at a mirror, Anthony was glad to find that his own skin had not discolored. On the contrary, a faint glow had kindled in his cheeks. He fancied that he had never looked so well. "'Enough for me,' said Dick, his tone that of an athlete in training. "'I want to go up and see the Gilberts. Won't you come?' "'Why, yes, if you don't dedicate me to the parents and dash off in the corner with Dora.' "'Not Dora, Gloria.' A clerk announced them over the phone, and, ascending to the tenth floor, they followed a winding corridor and knocked at 1088. The door was answered by a middle-aged lady, Mrs. Gilbert herself. "'How do you do?' She spoke in the conventional American lady-lady language. Well, I'm awfully glad to see you. Hasty interjections by Dick, and then, Mr. Patz? Well, do come in and leave your coat there. She pointed to a chair and changed her inflection to a deprecatory laugh full of minute gasps. This is really lovely, lovely. Why, Richard, you haven't been here for so long. No, no. The latter monosyllables served half as responses, half as periods, to some vague starts from Dick. Well, do sit down and tell me what you've been doing. One crossed and recrossed, one stood and bowed ever so gently, one smiled again and again with helpless stupidity, one wondered if she would ever sit down. At length one slid thankfully into a chair and settled for a pleasant call. I suppose it's because you've been busy as much as anything else smiled Mrs. Gilbert, somewhat ambiguously. The, as much as anything else, she used to balance all her more rickety sentences. She had two other ones, at least that's the way I look at it, and pure and simple. These three, alternated, gave each of her remarks an air of being a general reflection on life, as though she had calculated all causes and, at length, put her finger on the ultimate one. Richard Caramel's face, Anthony saw, was now quite normal. The brow and cheeks were of a flesh color, the nose politely inconspicuous. He had fixed his aunt with the bright yellow eye, giving her that acute and exaggerated attention that young males are accustomed to render to all females who are of no further value. "'Are you a writer too, Mr. Patz?' "'Well, perhaps we can all bask in Richard's fame.' Gentle laughter led by Mrs. Gilbert. "'Gloria's out,' she said with an air of laying down an axiom from which she would proceed to derive results. She's dancing somewhere. Gloria goes, goes, goes. I tell her I don't see how she stands it. She dances all afternoon and all night until I think she's going to wear herself to a shadow. Her father is very worried about her. She smiled from one to the other. They both smiled. She was composed, Anthony perceived, of a succession of semicircles and parabolas, like those figures that gifted folk make on the typewriter, Head, arms, bust, hips, thighs, and ankles were in a bewildering tier of roundnesses. Well-ordered and clean she was, with hair of an artificially rich gray. Her large face sheltered weather-beaten blue eyes, and was adorned with just the faintest white mustache. "'I always say,' she remarked to Anthony, "'that Richard is an ancient soul.' In the tense pause that followed, Anthony considered a pun, something about Dick having been much walked upon. We all have souls of different ages, continued Mrs. Gilbert radiantly. At least that's what I say. Perhaps so, agreed Anthony, with an air of quickening to a hopeful idea. The voice bubbled on. Gloria has a very young soul, irresponsible as much as anything else. 
She has no sense of responsibility. She's sparkling, Aunt Catherine, said Richard pleasantly. A sense of responsibility would spoil her. She's too pretty. Well, confessed Mrs. Gilbert, all I know is that she goes and goes and goes. The number of goings to Gloria's discredit was lost in the rattle of the doorknob as it turned to admit Mr. Gilbert. He was a short man with a moustache resting like a small white cloud beneath his undistinguished nose. He had reached the stage where his value as a social creature was a black and imponderable negative. His ideas were the popular delusions of twenty years before. His mind steered a wobbly and anemic course in the wake of the daily newspaper editorials. After graduating from a small but terrifying Western university, he had entered the celluloid business, and as this required only the minute measure of intelligence he brought to it, he did well for several years, in fact until about 1911, when he began exchanging contracts for vague agreements with the moving picture industry. The moving picture industry had decided about 1912 to gobble him up, and at this time he was, so to speak, delicately balanced on its tongue. Meanwhile, he was supervising manager of the Associated Midwestern Film Materials Company, spending six months of each year in New York and the remainder in Kansas City and St. Louis. He felt credulously that there was a good thing coming to him, and his wife thought so, and his daughter thought so, too. He disapproved of Gloria. She stayed out late, she never ate her meals, she was always in a mix-up. He had irritated her once, and she had used towards him words that he had not thought were part of her vocabulary. His wife was easier. After fifteen years of incessant guerrilla warfare, he had conquered her. It was a war of muddled optimism against organized dullness. And something in the number of yeses with which he could poison a conversation had won him the victory. Yes, 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 he would say. Yes, 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 yes. Let me see. That was the summer of, let me see, ninety-one or ninety-two? Yes, 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 yes. Fifteen years of yeses had beaten Mrs. Gilbert. Fifteen further years of that incessant, unaffirmative affirmative, accompanied by the perpetual flicking of ash mushrooms from thirty-two thousand cigars, had broken her. To this husband of hers she made the last concession of married life, which is more complete, more irrevocable, than the first. She listened to him. She told herself that the years had brought her tolerance. Actually, they had slain what measure she had ever possessed of moral courage. She introduced him to Anthony. "'This is Mr. Patts,' she said. The young man and the old touched flesh. Mr. Gilbert's hand was soft, worn away to the pulpy semblance of a squeezed grapefruit. Then husband and wife exchanged greetings. He told her it had grown colder out. He said he had walked down to a newsstand on 44th Street for a Kansas City paper. He had intended to ride back in the bus, but he had found it too cold. Yes, 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 too cold.' Mrs. Gilbert added flavor to his adventure by being impressed with his courage in braving the harsh air. "'Well, you are spunky!' she exclaimed admiringly. "'You are spunky. I wouldn't have gone out for anything.' Mr. Gilbert, with true masculine impassivity, disregarded the awe he had excited in his wife. He turned to the two young men and triumphantly routed them on the subject of the weather. Richard Caramel was called on to remember the month of November in Kansas. No sooner had the theme been pushed toward him, however, than it was violently fished back to be lingered over, pawed over, elongated, and generally devitalized by its sponsor. The immemorial thesis that the days somewhere were warm, but the nights very pleasant, was successfully propounded, and they decided the exact distance on an obscure railroad between two points that Dick had inadvertently mentioned. Anthony fixed Mr. Gilbert with a steady stare, and went into a trance through which, after a moment, Mrs. Gilbert's smiling voice penetrated. "'It seems as though the cold were damper here. It seems to eat into my bones.' As this remark, adequately yesed, had been on the tip of Mr. Gilbert's tongue, he could not be blamed for rather abruptly changing the subject. "'Where's Gloria?' "'She ought to be here any minute. "'Have you met my daughter, Mr.' "'Haven't had the pleasure. I've heard Dick speak of her often.' "'She and Richard are cousins.' "'Yes?' Anthony smiled with some effort. He was not used to the society of his seniors, and his mouth was stiff from superfluous cheerfulness. It was such a pleasant thought about Gloria and Dick being cousins. He managed within the next minute to throw an agonized glance at his friend. Richard Caramel was afraid they'd have to toddle off. 
Mrs. Gilbert was tremendously sorry. Mr. Gilbert thought it was too bad. Mrs. Gilbert had a further idea. Something about being glad they'd come, anyhow, even if they'd only seen an old lady, way too old to flirt with them. Anthony and Dick evidently considered this a sly sally, for they laughed one bar in three-four time. Would they come again soon? Oh, yes. Gloria would be awfully sorry. Goodbye. Goodbye. Smiles. Smiles. Bang. Two disconsolate young men walking down the tenth-floor corridor of the plaza, in the direction of the elevator. A Lady's Legs Behind Maury Noble's attractive indolence, his irrelevance, and his easy mockery, lay a surprising and relentless maturity of purpose. His intention, as he stated it in college, had been to use three years in travel, three years in utter leisure, and then to become immensely rich as quickly as possible. His three years of travel were over. He had accomplished the globe with an intensity and curiosity that, in anyone else, would have seemed pedantic, without redeeming spontaneity, almost the self-editing of a human Baedeker. But, in this case, it assumed an air of mysterious purpose and significant design, as though Maury Noble were some predestined antichrist, urged by a preordination to go everywhere there was to go, along the earth, and to see all the billions of humans who bred and wept and slew each other here and there upon it. Back in America he was sallying into the search for amusement, with the same consistent absorption. He who had never taken more than a few cocktails or a pint of wine at a sitting, taught himself to drink as he would have taught himself Greek. Like Greek, it would be the gateway to a wealth of new sensations, new psychic states, new reactions in joy or misery. His habits were a matter for esoteric speculation. He had three rooms in a bachelor apartment on 44th Street, but he was seldom to be found there. The telephone girl had received the most positive instructions that no one should even have his ear without first giving a name to be passed upon. She had a list of half a dozen people to whom he was never at home, and of the same number to whom he was always at home. Foremost on the latter list were Anthony Patch and Richard Caramel. Maury's mother lived with her married son in Philadelphia, and there Maury went usually for the weekends. So one Saturday night, when Anthony, prowling the chilly streets in a fit of utter boredom, dropped in at the Molten Arms, he was overjoyed to find that Mr. Noble was at home. His spirit soared faster than the flying elevator. This was so good, so extremely good, to be about to talk to Maury, who would be equally happy at seeing him. They would look at each other with a deep affection just behind their eyes, which both would conceal beneath some attenuated raillery. Had it been summer, they would have gone out together and indolently sipped two long Tom Collinses, as they wilted their collars, and watched the faintly diverting round of some lazy August cabaret. But it was cold outside, with wind around the edges of the tall buildings, and December just up the street, so better far an evening together under the soft lamplight and a drink or two of Bushmills or a thimbleful of Maury's Grand Marnier, with the books gleaming like ornaments against the walls, and Maury radiating a divine inertia as he rested, large and cat-like, in his favorite chair. There he was! The room closed about Anthony, warmed him. The glow of that strong persuasive mind, that temperament, almost oriental in its outward impassivity, warmed Anthony's restless soul and brought him a peace that could be likened only to the peace a stupid woman gives. One must understand all, else one must take all for granted. Maury filled the room, tiger-like, godlike. The winds outside were stilled. The brass candlesticks on the mantel glowed like tapers before an altar. What keeps you here today? Anthony spread himself over a yielding sofa and made an elbow rest among the pillows. Just been here an hour. Tea dance, and I stayed so late I missed my train to Philadelphia. Strange to stay so long, commented Anthony curiously. Rather. What'd you do? Geraldine. Little usher at Keith's. I told you about her. Oh. Paid me a call about three and stayed till five. Peculiar little soul. She gets me. She's so utterly stupid. Moria was silent. Strange as it may seem, continued Anthony, so far as I'm concerned, and even so far as I know, Geraldine is a paragon of virtue. He had known her a month, a girl of nondescript and nomadic habits. Someone had casually passed her on to Anthony, who considered her amusing and rather liked the chaste and fairy-like kisses she had given him on the third night of their acquaintance, when they had driven in a taxi through the park. 
She had a vague family, a shadowy aunt and uncle who shared with her an apartment in the labyrinthine hundreds. She was company, familiar and faintly intimate and restful. Further than that he did not care to experiment, not from any moral compunction, but from a dread of allowing any entanglement to disturb what he felt was the growing serenity of his life. She has two stunts, he informed Maury. One of them is to get her hair over her eyes some way and then blow it out, and the other is to say, you crazy, when someone makes a remark that's over her head. It fascinates me. I sit there hour after hour, completely intrigued by the maniacal symptoms she finds in my imagination. Maury stirred in his chair and spoke. Remarkable that a person can comprehend so little and yet live in such a complex civilization. A woman like that actually takes the whole universe in the most matter-of-fact way. From the influence of Rousseau to the bearing of the tariff rates on her dinner, the whole phenomenon is utterly strange to her. She'd just been carried along from an age of spearheads and plunked down here with the equipment of an archer for going into a pistol duel. You could sweep away the entire crust of history, and she'd never know the difference. I wish our Richard would write about her. Anthony, surely you don't think she's worth writing about? As much as anybody, he answered, yawning. You know, I was thinking today that I have a great confidence in Dick, so long as he sticks to people and not to ideas, and as long as his inspirations come from life and not from art, and always granting a normal growth, I believe he'll be a big man. I should think the appearance of the black notebook would prove that he's going to life. Anthony raised himself on his elbow and answered eagerly. He tries to go to life. So does every author except the very worst, but, after all, most of them live on pre-digested food. The incident or character may be from life, but the writer usually interprets it in terms of the last book he read. For instance, suppose he meets a sea captain and thinks he's an original character. The truth is that he sees the resemblance between the sea captain and the last sea captain Dana created, or whoever creates sea captains, and therefore he knows how to set the sea captain on paper. Dick, of course, can set down any consciously picturesque character-like character, but could he accurately transcribe his own sister? Then they were off for half an hour on literature. A classic, suggested Anthony, is a successful book that has survived the reaction of the next period or generation. Then it's safe, like a style in architecture or furniture. It's acquired a picturesque dignity to take the place of its fashion. After a time, the subject temporarily lost its tang. The interest of the two young men was not particularly technical. They were in love with generalities. Anthony had recently discovered Samuel Butler, and the brisk aphorisms in the notebook seemed to him the quintessence of criticism. Maury, his whole mind so thoroughly mellowed by the very hardness of his scheme of life, seemed inevitably the wiser of the two, yet in the actual stuff of their intelligence they were not, it seemed, fundamentally different. They drifted from letters to the curiosities of each other's day. Whose tea was it? People named Abercrombie. Why'd you stay late? Meet a luscious debutante? Yes. Did you really? Anthony's voice lifted in surprise. Not a debutante, exactly. Said she came out two winters ago in Kansas City. Sort of a leftover? No, answered Maury with some amusement. I think that's the last thing I'd say about her. She seemed, well, somehow the youngest person there. Not too young to make you miss a train. Young enough. Beautiful child. Anthony chuckled in his one-syllable snort. Oh, Maury, you're in your second childhood. What do you mean by beautiful? Maury gazed helplessly into space. Well, I can't describe her exactly, except to say that she was beautiful. She was tremendously alive. She was eating gumdrops. What? It was a sort of attenuated vice. She's a nervous kind, said she always ate gumdrops at teas because she had to stand around so long in one place. What'd you talk about? Bergson? Bilfism? Whether the one step is immoral? Maury was unruffled. His fur seemed to run all ways. As a matter of fact, we did talk on Bilfism. Seems her mother's a Bilfist. Mostly, though, we talked about legs. Anthony rocked in glee. My God, whose legs? Hers. She talked a lot about hers as though they were a sort of choice bric-a-brac. She roused a great desire to see them. What is she, a dancer? No, I found out she was a cousin of Dick's. Anthony sat upright so suddenly that the pillow he released stood on end like a live thing and dove to the floor. 
Name's Gloria Gilbert? he cried. Yes. Isn't she remarkable? I'm sure I don't know, but for sheer dullness, her father— Well, interrupted Moray with implacable conviction, her family may be as sad as professional mourners, but I'm inclined to think that she is a quite authentic and original character. The outer signs of the cut-and-dried Yale prom girl and all that, but different, very emphatically different. Go on, go on, urged Anthony. Soon as Dick told me she didn't have a brain in her head, I knew she must be pretty good. Did he say that? Swore to it, said Anthony, with another snorting laugh. Well, what he means by brains in a woman is— I know, interrupted Anthony eagerly. He means a smattering of literary misinformation. That's it. The kind who believes that the annual moral letdown of the country is a very good thing, or the kind who believes it's a very ominous thing. Either pince-nez or postures. Well, this girl talked about legs. She talked about skin, too, her own skin, always her own. She told me the sort of tan she'd like to get in the summer, and how closely she usually approximated it. You sat enraptured by her low alto? By her low alto? No, by tan. I began thinking about tan. I began to think what color I turned when I made my last exposure about two years ago. I did used to get a pretty good tan. I used to get a sort of bronze, if I remember rightly. Anthony retired into the cushions, shaken with laughter. She's got you going. Oh, Maury. Maury the Connecticut lifesaver. The human nutmeg. Extra. Eris elopes with Coast Guard because of his luscious pigmentation, afterward found to be Tasmanian strain in his family. Maury sighed. Rising, he walked to the window and raised the shade. Snowing hard. Anthony, still laughing quietly to himself, made no answer. Another winter. Maury's voice from the window was almost a whisper. We're growing old, Anthony. I'm twenty-seven, by God, three years to thirty, and then I'm what an undergraduate calls a middle-aged man. Anthony was silent for a moment. You are old, Maury, he agreed at length. The first signs of a very dissolute and wobbly senescence. You have spent the afternoon talking about tan and a lady's legs. Maury pulled down the shade with a sudden harsh snap. Idiot, he cried. That from you. Here I sit, young Anthony, as I'll sit for a generation or more, and watch such gay souls as you and Dick and Gloria Gilbert go past me, dancing and singing and loving and hating one another, and being moved, being eternally moved. And I am moved only by my lack of emotion. I shall sit, and the snow will come, oh, for a caramel to take notes, and another winter and I shall be thirty, and you and Dick and Gloria will go on being eternally moved, and dancing by me and singing. But— after you've all gone, I'll be saying things for new dicks to write down, and listening to the disillusions and cynicisms and emotions of new Anthonys, yes, and talking to new Glorias about the tans and summers yet to come. The firelight flurried up on the hearth. Maury left the window, stirred the blaze with a poker, and dropped a log upon the andirons. Then he sat back in his chair, and the remnants of his voice faded in the new fire that spit red and yellow along the bark. After all, Anthony, it's you who are very romantic and young. It's you who are infinitely more susceptible and afraid of your calm being broken. It's me who tries again and again to be moved. Let myself go a thousand times, and I'm always me. Nothing quite stirs me. Yet, he murmured, after another long pause, there was something about that little girl with her absurd tan that was eternally old, like me. End of Book 1, Chapter 2, Part 1 of 2